Hi, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Karen Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel podcast. This seat taken. Hey, Kiernan. Hello, Ryan. Am I glowing? Oh my gosh. Am I glowing, you, Ryan? You are. You look like you just gave birth to a baby. Is that <laughs> is that something that happened? Um. Well, I. You know, we. I do have an announcement to make. Uh-oh. Um. But I, I actually have two announcements. The first announcement is, of course, topic of today's show. The I. I birth uh, uh, an interview. <laughs> is that, that's a nice way to say it. Yes, you birthed, I birthed an interview. An interview with. The founder of a publishing house. It's, it's a publishing house I've talked about on the podcast before. It's called Jean-Glez Publishing. And uh, I, I interview the founder of it named Thomas Jean-Glez. <laughs> Thomas Zunk, I love that name. Zunk yeah, well, he is French. He's got a, a beautiful accent that you'll, you'll be listening to. And we talk all about, you know, what it's like to, to found a, a travel company. These are my favorite travel guides out there. It's called the Secret <laughs> Series, like Secret New York, Secret London, Secret Paris, Secret Brussels, etc. How many and, times have I, have I heard you say, these are my seek favorite travel guides out there? <laughs> like, <laughs> Oh, no, you've only heard me say it about two different travel guides. Oh, okay. The, so. the, the first is uh, these, uh, the secret guides. But right. these are the like truly off the beaten track stuff you will never see in any other right. guidebooks. And my are, we, favorite, are we breaking the secret today? Are we like, is this like a, you know? I mean, I hope so, because this man yeah. deserves all the success in the world. I hope that they, they, they are falling off the shelves. They're so popular. And, um, and, and then my favorite traditional guidebook, which is, you know, a little bit maybe hipper, uh, cooler than the Fromers and Foders, is uh, the Moon Guides. Those are, those are my favorite, more traditional. They have kind of all, all around um, the, uh, oh, but I, I guess I do say Rick Steves as well. Ugh. I am a, a, an enthusiast. You, 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 uh, and you have a wondering eye when it comes to travel guides. So, <laughs> well, anyway, my, my <laughs> for, for off the beaten track stuff, uh, there's nothing better than these secret guides. So, um, and, and also Thomas Jungles is, is a huge traveler himself. He talks about, uh, when he was, uh, it, just out of high school, he actually, uh, got a one way ticket from Paris to China and he traveled overland back to Paris. His family were not major travelers before that. So can you imagine taking on that adventure? Yeah, that, that, that does sound like quite an adventure. I, I, and and that, did that inspire him to become a, uh, I guess I need to listen to the interview. Yeah, you oh, just got to listen to the it, yeah. it, it would It would, it would uh, just be a waste of time for me to recount to you all of the stories that he will then tell in the interview. So you see where that might be duplicative for the listener? Right, I do see that, yeah. Sure. <laughs> but but uh, I do, to, to your point before, I do have a second announcement, a big announcement. Uh, is this a recalculate? <laughs> no, no, it's not recalculate. No, no, no oh. I, I'm not correcting something. Oh, I, well, though I guess, no. actually, it is a follow-up to something that I've said. So maybe it could technically be a recalculating. <laughs> right, but, but it doesn't I, really I fall so. in the spirit of the recalculating. No, no, it's not yeah. in the spirit of the recalculating. Yeah. That is Ryan. I have created life. I, ha- I, ha- I there there is a child uh, with half of my uh, DNA in it. Yeah, and you've and you've you've before you said that you you got the DNA test results back. We're we're confident. Well, you know, I, I'm choosing to raise him as my own, regardless. <laughs> That's probably for the best. Uh, uh, his, his, name, ha- his name is Charlie. Little little Charlie. Little Charlie. You know, it's a strong name. You've got uh, yeah. uh, uh, Chaplin uh, Brown. Um, uh, Prince Charles is who I think of. Prince Charles, absolutely, yeah. put, definitely. That primarily among the uh, yeah. the inspirations was yeah. Prince Charles, the okay, and the King Royal Charles. Uh, King, well, soon to be King Charles, hopefully, God willing. Well, no, I meant the previous King oh, Charles. Oh, sure, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, King Charles of England, of course, <laughs> married a Catholic, which which pissed off a lot of those Protestants. Yeah, I mean, and and you know, you didn't even marry a Catholic, so uh. no, that's true. It's sort of a reverse King <laughs> yeah. Charles, that where where my wife married a Catholic. Um, but you know, where well, I am excited. I've spoken before about how I've been collecting lots of like a uh, travel inspired right. children's books, and you know, Char- I'm determined that Charlie's going to have to get that passport real soon. And what was the first song that that Charlie listened to? Well, the first, I mean, Ryan, fittingly enough. Uh, you know, I, I only really had one choice for the first uh, song that he could that that could uh, <clears throat> fall upon his ears, which is of course the out of office theme song. Uh, and th- he will not be the first or the last child to be th- to hear the out of office theme song. I think. I mean, my dream is to license it to crib makers everywhere, yeah. so that when you want your child to fall asleep uh, or perk up, actually, when you want your child to perk up, you just hear that 
uh, that melodious. And we always recommend to new parents, and I'm sure you're following this. It, it, the best way to keep your child happy and to make them a great traveler is to just uh, put your iPhone down by their head and they go to bed at night and just let the out of office podcast right. play for, for a good nine, 10 hours. Uh, because that, that hours really end, get these folks, acu- these, yeah, these babies accustomed to the idea of travel and they will feed their wanderlust uh as 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 infants <laughs> absolutely just uh ad, 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 us ad nauseum i will say it did occur to me so in the first few weeks you're often holding a child and then going shh 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 to try to calm them and i thought you know with all my podcasting gear here maybe i could just sit for an hour and go shh 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 and we could release it as an episode and then i could just play that whenever i needed to calm them I love it. I love it. I mean, it would it, it, if you could tie it to Peru in some way, it would fit with your general theme. <laughs> yeah. Peru part four. <laughs> shh. That's, that's the audience saying, shh, we've learned yeah. enough about Peru. <laughs> part five, technically. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So anyway, we have a, we have a brand new listener. We're going to have to get him an iPhone so that uh, he'll be counted against the downloads. And, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be recording uh, uh, all of the adventures that Charlie uh, takes us on. It, it opens up a whole new content bucket for us, traveling <laughs> with children. Oh, I can't wait. Absolutely. Well, Ryan, I, ma- Mommy, Daddy, Pods, yeah. that's, that's a whole... I, it, it, it brings a new <laughs> meaning to potty training. Can, can I tell you a story that has to do with this? She absolutely. I was in Washington, D.C. Uh, a couple weeks ago, and I wanted to go grab a drink at my favorite uh, Washington, D.C. wine bar, good old D.O. wine bar. I walked in and they said, uh, uh, toddler happy hour, uh, four to five. And I said, oh, great. I'm not a toddler, but, you know, I'm sure it's fine. Sure. I walk in, place looks like a daycare center. I mean, oh, ridiculous. Like heaven. And I go and I, I sit at the bar and the woman comes over to me and she says, did you bring a child with you? And I was like, <laughs> uh, did I bring a child with me to the fancy wine bar? I, it's like I did checking not. your ID, but they check right, your the child. Opposite, the opposite. Yeah. They were, and they were like, sorry, this is only for parents and, and, and their guard and parents and guardians. And Are I was you like, serious? Yeah, they wouldn't even let me have a drink. So I'm, you know, uh, so yeah, so I, I, you know, I was about to text my, my uh, cousin's wife and be like, hey, can you bring our godson over so I can, he can sit and watch me, watch me pound alcohol at four o'clock in the afternoon. But that, uh, that's yeah. insane. Yeah, I, I thought so too. It's not a great policy. No. I mean. If, if I don't mind being around a bunch of crawling children in, a, in the wine bar, that should be my prerogative. If anything, know? that should make you want to drink more. I, I, I was, I, 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 anyway, so that's my story. So I might have to borrow uh, Charlie, Charlie at some point. Yeah, you can borrow um, a little Charlie anytime yeah, yeah. you want, as long as you're going drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you want to watch him so badly, Ryan? Well, there's just a couple happy hours I just really want to hit, and they require babies, so, you know. <laughs> 2019. All right, Ryan. Well, um, you know, I, we're, we're, I'm, I'm just merging into fatherhood. So today uh, we're going we're gonna to have that interview. But before we get to the interview with Thomas John Glez, we do have to do a bit of a recalculating. Oh, no. Did you make a mistake? Recalculating. Now, Ryan, you know what recalculating is, right? Yes, I do. Yeah. yeah. And what, it, what, what is it? It's, it's generally when you have made some sort of factual error. And then it's, we have to correct it on the podcast. Okay. So, so you're right. It, it is when we revisit a topic that right. we've revisit, already talked yeah. about. And sometimes you've made a mistake. Sometimes I've made a mistake. Sometimes it's just an update. Um, often about wow air, sometimes about uh, 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 over tourism. <laughs> and uh, in this case, however, it is uh, a, a factual correction and, and an apology from me. Um, and I, I, I highly regret this one. Uh, so do you remember in uh, the, 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 the last episode of the Great Peru Trilogy, um, I, we were talking about Hiram Bingham, who was the, uh, the Yale professor that, that uh, sort of rediscovered uh, Machu Picchu. Wait, so this is the Yale professor who just, who, who, quote unquote, rediscovered you know, the Columbus right. of Machu Picchu. And then he went and just took all the artifacts and took them yeah, back to Yale. Yeah, yeah. Who took all the artifacts. And, I, yeah. and we made a bit of hay. I asserted it, but we both made a bit of hay out of the fact that Yale uh, hasn't returned these artifacts. Yeah. And, and it really pisses Peru off. Shame on Yale, right? Am it's I right sh- on that? that? I mean, that is what we've, we're saying. But, but <laughs> No, we're not qu- saying that anymore? No, no. Qu- in yeah. fact, we are praising Yale now. Uh, so uh, hoop-de-doo and hurrah to Yale. 
Um, because as it turns out, uh, that, that was some outdated information. And Yale University has actually been a model in working with the government of Peru to return archaeological materials excavated by Hiram Bingham back to Peru. Really? All the way back to Peru? Yeah. So they, they, they signed a historic accord in uh, November 2010. And uh, in 2010 and 2011 and 2012, they actually repatriated the, uh, all of the items that, uh, that uh, Bingham had, had sent because the, per the Peruvians were saying the understanding when we allowed him to take these artifacts was that he would return them to New Haven, uh, he would study them, and then they would come back home permanently. And, uh, you know, it, it actually is quite an inspiring story because not only have the uh, artifacts been returned, but because of this, uh, the Yale and uh, Peru have agreed to a number of archaeological workshops in Peru during the summers of 2013 and 2014. So they're actually working together to help preserve this history, quite the opposite of what uh, I, and, and because of I, you, uh, were mm -hmm. saying about uh, Yale's attitude towards these artifacts. Well, that, that, is, that is really good to know. You know, I'm always one uh, to give Yale the benefit of the doubt. And, uh, you know, you as a, I think you went to a different school. Uh, you don't always give Yale the benefit of the doubt. So I'm glad that we are here correcting the record uh, that Yale, uh, you know, super culturally sensitive, super woke school. And, and they did the right I thing mean, here. Let's not go. Let's not go too overboard. <laughs> I mean, let's, let's not forget where Brett Kavanaugh got his law degree. Okay. So let's just keep it in check. Uh, in this case, I yeah. was wrong about Yale. And uh, Yale and other institutions uh, make mistakes, but sometimes they do the right thing. And sure. so um, the, uh, it, it, this does come with a, a further Peru tip. In fact, maybe we should call this uh, interview with Thomas oh, no. Jean Glass. And, oh, and no. just a Folks, little bit of not, Peru. This interview is not about Peru. It's not about <laughs> Peru, I promise. But except this part is about Peru. <laughs> oh, and this, no. this is to say <laughs> there is a museum in Cusco called Museo Machu Picchu, and that is where these artifacts now live. So on your way uh, through Cusco to Machu Picchu, stop by. You can uh, learn all about the Yale partnership and, and see uh, these uh, great historic treasures. All right. Well, I, 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 I for one, think this uh, recalculating was, was well-deserved by Yale. They really, uh, they really showed us. Yeah, and, uh, and it's a sincere mea culpa uh, from an altar boy who knows when he's done wrong. Um, <laughs> but, Ryan, uh, without further delay, we got a meaty interview to get to with Thomas Jangles, the founder of Jangles Publishing and the mind behind some of my very favorite guidebooks. I think it's time to take off. Tell the cabin crew. Flight attendants, prepare for takeoff, please. Today I'm joined by Thomas Jangles, the founder of Jangles Publishing, which I should spell out for my listeners. It's J O N G L E Z. And uh, Jangles Publishing publishes my favorite guidebook series out there, The Secret Guides. These emphasize odd, unusual, and often overlooked treasures that dot cities around the world. And as you'd expect, Thomas is an avid explorer of the world himself. He's traveled to over 100 countries, most notably journeying overland from Beijing to Paris. So we're going to dig into that and what it takes to have a successful guidebook series. Thomas, thank you so much for coming on Out of Office. Thank you. So let's start with a little bit of your biography. You know, I've, I've obviously said you're really, I mean, you are a world explorer if ever there was one. So give us a sense of, you know, how you came to travel book publishing and, and exploring the world. Yeah. Well, basically my first, uh, I grew up in, in a very bourgeois family, very traditional family in Paris. Basically my parents never traveled. Uh, and everything started when I was 18 with a couple of friends. We decided like in the movies, you know, to take a, a globe and to, by chance, with uh, shut eyes, to put the finger on a globe and say, okay, we're going to travel there this summer. <laughs> so the first, that was our first trip. Four friends, we went to India and Nepal. Mm. Uh, I was 18. So that's Boy, what... that, that is a major first trip. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's where I got the virus, basically, of, of traveling. And uh, that was such an amazing trip. 18 years old with three friends, you know, in India with, uh, well, everything that's in India, you know. Uh, so I never, I never stopped traveling after that. Um, after, during my studies, um, we had to do like a kind of six months work period. Mm -hmm. uh, I decided to learn Japanese. I went to Japan for two months 
And then I said, okay, well, while I'm in Japan, I should stay in the area. So finally, I stayed six months in Asia, Japan, Thailand, Indonesia, where I worked a bit and traveled as well. After my studies, uh, I decided I, didn't, I was not ready to work. So I took a one-way ticket to Beijing, and I came back overland from Beijing to Paris. That was a fantastic trip that lasted seven months. Mm. So I crossed from Beijing. I went to Tibet. I uh, got into Tibet illegally because at that time it was not legal to come from uh, northern China. Right. Uh, I had how, did, to ha- how, how, how did you manage that? Well, I've, in fact, I've been so lucky in fact <laughs> in this trip <laughs> because uh, I took the train that at the time used to stop much further north of, of Tibet. The, the train at the time that was 95 didn't go to, to Lhasa. So we went to the, the, the dead end of the train station, of the, of the train lines, and then we took a bus. It's like, it used to be like a 30-hour bus to Lhasa. But in the train, we met a Chinese philosopher lady, a very nice lady, and she said, but you're never going to be able to buy a ticket for this bus. It's forbidden to foreigners. Mm-hmm. And she said, but I'm going to help you. I'll buy the tickets for you. And when we have military controls in the bus, you could just need to hide uh, below your blanket, <laughs> and I'll divert. I'll divert the Chinese, the, the Chinese uh, army guys, and everything's gonna happen well. Oh and, and that's God. what happened. We had about four to five military controls on the way. We haven't been uh, seen, and we managed to to reach La Salle this. It was fantastic. Boy, that is like uh, it, there's uh, there's a lot cinematic about your story. Uh, that's like how you know prisoners typically escape out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> Then uh, from Lhasa, um, we hitchhiked, basically. We, well, we rent a truck uh, with four, five, six, peop- six different people. And we went to the Mount Kailash, which is the holiest place in Asia because it's, it's uh, the highest mountain in the world that has never been climbed. Wow. Uh, because it's a holy mountain. So we rent a truck to get there in a week. And then the truck came back to Lhasa. And so we were stuck in the middle of nowhere and we uh, wanted to go to Pakistan. So we said, with a friend of mine, we said, okay, let's hitchhike. So we stand, we stood in the middle of nowhere on the Tibetan plateau. And uh, we've been, we waited for a couple of hours. And again, (laughs) a piece of luck, Chinese army trucks came in and uh, we stopped them and say, okay, we're going to Kashgar, which was like one week truck from there. Uh Uh-huh. And the guy said, okay, how much can you pay? Because we had to pay to be here for hitchhiking. So we paid a reasonable amount and they took us on board for one week. So in fact, we spent one week in a forbidden area uh, with the Chinese uh, army. And we were sleeping in the army barracks at night. That was just mind-blowing. And that's how we got to to Kashgar. And when we got to Kashgar, I remember that the people in Kashgar said, but where are you coming from? Which, Which road did you take? They said, we're coming from Mount Kailash. And they said, no, 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 this is not possible. There's no road. They say, yeah, well, there's no road, but we took it because we were, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we were with the Chinese army. So we've been able and we've been allowed to take this road because of the, the army guys that took us on board. But that's all the way it happened. Then we went to Pakistan and then uh, I had to go to India to get the visa for Iran. Uh, so I finally stayed two months in India where I learned meditation, traveled around, came back to Pakistan, then crossed to Iran. Uh, go to, uh, went to Kurdistan, then uh, all to Istanbul, Greece, Macedonia, Albania. Took the boat to Italy and then came overland by train to Paris, which is great. So, so that, after that se- must have been quite the homecoming. Yeah, yeah. After seven months of, of traveling, I came back by the TGV, you know, the fast train in France. Yeah. And I got to Paris train station uh, where my family was waiting for me. So that was amazing. Are your parents just totally sick with fear? <laughs> as as you're out there, given that they are not travelers? This first trip, which was seven months long, as I said, there was at the time, there was no mobile phone, there was no internet. Right. And uh, I think I called twice only. Oh, oh my God. And I think <laughs> I sent three or four letters maximum. So I must say my parents were a bit uh, worried, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it seems like your approach to travel, you embrace a certain amount of kind of luck and fortune. Right. I mean, you take risks. Uh, I'm sure they're calculated risks. Yeah. Um, but it seems like you just throw yourself out there and you're willing to to ask. Yeah. 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 That's is one thing I, I always remember to do, but even in professional life, you know, 
Uh, I think it's even one thing that Steve Jobs used to say. He said, you know, if you want one thing, just ask for it. You know, and, and 50% of the cases, they will, people would just say yes. Right. Just because, <laughs> just because you asked. You know, if you don't ask, the, the, the probability that it, it should happen, it's maybe 10%. If you ask, it goes up to 50 or 70%. So yeah. just, just ask for it and it may happen. Also, your lesson with the Chinese army shows, you know, if you're carrying enough currency, you can also grease the wheels a bit along the way. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, a little bit. But in fact, during all my travels, I was hardly confronted to corruption. Very little, very Mm. little. Yeah. Wow, that's quite incredible, given given the the variety of uh, countries and, and also, you know, what the political systems were at the time. Yeah. Uh, In fact, the the most amazing... uh, thing with corruption was in Brazil when I used to live in Brazil before I moved to Berlin. And the first trip we've made was in Brazil. So we, we were living in Rio and we took the plane to go to Amazonia. And then so we had to rent a car for a couple of weeks and I had to give it back at the Rio airport. And to make the check-in at the counter, I left the car like one minute. And because my, my, my wife was staying there and she got in the airport one minute. So came back after one minute and then there's an Police guy, police officer, saying, ah, what you've done is really bad. Mm. Okay. But, uh, so after some time, he said, no, okay, so I'm going to take your car out because uh, I'm going to call the, the police and uh, they remove your car and it's over. Your car is gone. I said, no, 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 come on. I can't do that. It's a rented car. Right. I have to give it back. And he says, yes, there may be an option. <laughs> there may be an option. You know, I have two kids. School is expensive. I say, yeah, yeah, probably I can help you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then we finally, and it was amazing because we negotiated the price of how much he wanted. And he said, no, okay, so give me 500 reais, which was about $100. Mm-hmm. I said, no, no, that's too much. It's impossible. So finally, we managed on 20. And the guy said, but okay, don't give it to me here because at the airport, there's a camera watching mm-hmm. us. Mm-hmm. So I'll take my motorbike. You're going to follow me on the highway. And at some point, I will stop. You'll give me the money, and then you will keep going. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what we did. we did. And that was amazing. And when we stopped, so I gave him the money, and he said to me, but remember, what you've done was really bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny. For somebody who uh, so embraces kind of, uh, you know, where the road happens to take you, it's not a natural step in my mind, that you would then go into kind of guidebooks. So yeah, yeah. why don't you talk about um, that decision? How, how did you end up in that industry? Yeah. In fact, uh, when I came back from this trip overland from Beijing to Paris, uh, I did another trip in South America for six months, but that's also a different story at the same time, or a year later. But then I came back to Paris, and I was still not ready to work. I was 25. And I said, no, uh, uh, and I thought about, when I was in Pakistan during the Beijing-Paris trip, I thought about writing a guidebook about Paris, about secret Paris, because I knew a number of places which were secret and very interesting in Paris. Mm. So I came back to Paris, um, joined with a friend, and we started writing this guidebook. We've been accepted by a publisher, and it took us two years walking in the streets of Paris to discover the secrets of Paris. The book was a success, but at the time, in my mind, I said, no, this is not a serious job. And I need a serious job. You know, I had made a business school in Paris, etc. So I said, no, I need a serious job. So I've been um, hired by um, a major steel company at the time called Isnor, which became uh, Arcelor, and um, ArcelorMittal, which is now the number one steel company in the world, where I spent eight years. Uh, and after six years, basically, I went to a trip to Siberia. Uh, close to Lake Baikal. And we went hiking four or five days to the sources of the the major Lena River, which is a major Siberian river. And in this trip, one night I remember we were camping. And for no reason, you know, I was not looking for any ID or nothing. The idea that, okay, working in the steel industry is not for you. You've written this guidebook on Secret Paris five, six years ago, which you loved doing. Think about what about setting up your publishing house because as a writer it's very difficult to live with uh, travel guides but as a publisher it could be easier mm. so this idea came to me like that without even looking for it then i came back to at the time i was living in brussels 
came back to Brussels, starting writing the second Brussels. And then I met by chance again some people in Paris in publishing, because I knew nothing about publishing at the time. Right. The, <laughs> yeah. I Steel industry to publishing is yeah. not the, the natural trajectory. I had nobody in the family. I had nobody around. You know, I had no link with publishing. And I met a major, very large French publishing house by chance. I talked to the guy and said, okay, I have this project of a series of secret guides. I'm uh, writing at the moment this, the first guide on Brussels, secret Brussels. What do you think? He said, yeah, that's a very good idea. Um, let's make a co-publishing deal. You bring the book and then we'll print it, we'll promote it, etc." And that's, that's what we've done. So we've published together as a co as a co branding co publishing uh, the secret brussels that was in 2003 or 2 and it worked it was a success uh, so i said to myself well wow, let's make a second guide uh, to validate more or less that this model is is working so i've met a journalist in marseille at the time which at the time in southern france marseille was a non touristic city at all there was nobody going there it was a very dull city it has changed a lot, but at the time it was very dull. Nobody was visiting. And I took the risk of publishing a book on Secret Marseille. And it was again a success. So at the time I went to see my boss in the steel company and said, well, you know what? I think I'm going to leave. And he said, no, 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 you can't do that. I've just hired you. So we'll make a deal. You finish your job. It takes one more year. And in a year... I will fire you and I will give you, because in France there's a special labor law. Yes. I, I will give you a check, like uh, some money to set up your company. Ah, beautiful. Beautiful. I said, okay, let's do that. <laughs> that and that's what we've done because uh, luckily he was still in, uh, he still had the job. So he respected what he, is, what he had promised. He gave me the money and I left the company and that was 2005. And with this money that he gave me, I could set up the company and start publishing travel guides. We started with Secret Paris, again, a new edition, and Secret Rome, et cetera, et cetera. And then it got started. And for the, for the listeners who don't know the Secret Guides, uh, give a sense of, of what kind of uh, attractions and curiosities you're searching out and how you find them. Yeah. So basically, the concept is very different from any travel guides that you've ever seen. We always ask, the authors to be locals. So Secret Paris is written by Parisians. Secret New York is written by New Yorkers. Secret New Orleans is written by people from New Orleans, etc., etc. And we always ask them, okay, please look for secrets, places, stories, details that even the local people don't know, even that the people who live in the city don't know. Which means the target of the secret guides are both the people who live in the city and imagine if the people of the sea themselves don't know the, the, these places. Imagine the tourists they would even less know these places. So, which means when you buy one of these secret guides, basically you are almost 100% sure that you go well away off the beaten track. And if you go, for example, to Venice or to Rome or to Barcelona or to Paris, to these very touristy cities, even to New York, you can be sure that the places that we talk about you basically will be almost alone. You can, in Rome, you could discover an amazing church with cloisters, beautiful, with amazing frescoes, etc., with nobody around. Because even Romans don't know this church, for example. So that's the idea. And the content is mostly cultural, historical, it's architecture, it's uh, secret museums, it's uh, secret gardens, private collections, etc. So there's no bar, no restaurant, no hotel, no shop. <laughs> it's cultural, uh, historical. It's like, okay, what should I see? What can I see? Uh, I want to escape the crowds. Where do I go? And where do I go and, uh, to visit something interesting? Of course, it's not to, we're not, we're not going to point out uh, like a, a secret place, but which is not so interesting. So it's interesting places, beautiful places that even locals don't know. So basically, that, that's the idea of the secret guides. I thought I'd share. Uh... For me, one of the most memorable uh, that I've been to. I mean, at, at this point, I've seen, I've I've probably visited hundreds of the stops that your guidebooks point to. Mm -hmm. um, but there's one that's extremely humble that just sticks with me and really captures uh, what the secret guides can can open up to people. It's called the Ferryman Seat in uh, on the South Bank in London. 
Yeah. And on this little um, kind of unassuming alley that you'd never uh, really blink at, there's a there's a Greek souvlaki uh, restaurant. Yeah. And there's this uh, small uh, stone uh, seat that's kind of set into the wall, and it's tiny. I mean, I like modern Americans would find it hard to sit on. This. <laughs> <laughs> it's this flinty, uncomfortable rock that's maybe a foot by two feet. Yeah. And what this was, uh, it used to be set directly above the Thames. And uh, before 1750, when London Bridge was opened, uh, uh, ferrymen used to park their narrow little taxis there. And they would sit on these seats and let kind of the drunks coming out of the bars and coming out of the theaters, including the Globe Theater close by, mm-hmm. fill up their taxis. They would wait on these tiny little seats and then they would ferry them across uh, to the other side of the Thames. And this just struck me. I had walked by this neighborhood, by this alley hundreds of times and had never noticed this little seat. I never, w- it never would have caught my eye. Um, but that's what I love. I mean, to your point, I think these guides are wonderful for, in my mind, two two sets of people. The first are people who live in a place and, and are just looking to kind of fall back in love with it. Um, and secondly, if you're a traveler or even a business traveler who finds yourself frequenting a city and you've, you know, you've really worn out kind of the, the major tourist attractions. I mean, by this point I had gone to the British museum, you know, tens of (laughs) times I had looked at the Rosetta stone as closely as you possibly could. I was looking for, for that next deeper level of tourism. And uh, that's what they open up. And so they're, I, I mean, I, I love to give them to folks that live in the cities that you cover. And, uh, and that ferryman seat, you know, it just, it's, it's something that could look so ordinary, but once you know where it came from, it's extraordinary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So who do you hire to, to write these guides today and what is their research process like? So basically, uh, it can be very, very, it can be a journalist, it can be a, a writer. Like a novel writer, it can be a historian. Uh, it's usually not travel guide writers, because uh, travel guide writers usually they don't understand, which is amazing, but they don't understand that these guides are different of the, from the other ones. So I regularly receive emails, for example, of people saying, okay, oh, "Okay, I've seen your travel secret guides. I love them. I live like whatever. I live in uh, San Francisco. I live in LA. Whatever. I'd like to write the secret LA." Okay. So basically what, what I'm, I do is, okay, please send me back an email with a first list of, say, 30 places and three full written texts with the pictures mm-hmm. to have a, an idea of what you think is secret. And this, when, when the proposed people are, are travel guide writers, they cannot change their system. You know, they cannot think about, okay, the target is not the tourist anymore. It's not the main, or it's not the, the main tourist. It may be the twist. It's, it has to be more focused. It has to be really secret. They can't understand that. So basically, it's not travel guides writers. It's yeah, local people always, as we said, journalists, historians, uh, writers, because it needs to. Yeah, you need to be able to write well because otherwise it takes too much time to make corrections, ed- edits, etc. Uh, so that's the kind of people we use to to write the secret guides. It takes between two to five years. Mm-hmm. Each guide, because mm-hmm. there's so much to know. For example, New York, so much to know. Uh, Paris, London, cities like Tokyo, for example. Uh, even Venice, which I wrote myself. Um, I spent seven years in Venice, living in Venice. It took me the first two years to understand the city reasonably well, and another five years to, de- to delve into the secrets. So basically, Secret Venice took me five years. I bought all the books about Venice that have been written. I read basically everything. And everything that was in his books, I just removed them from the list of the Secret Venice. Right. <laughs> so that's basically what I said to the, to, the, to the authors. I say, okay, take what is in traditional travel guides, remove everything, and start from zero. Yeah. Start again. <laughs> start again and imagine you're talking to your neighbor and uh, you should surprise your neighbor with 10 places, like five minutes walk from, from where you live that your neighbor would not know. And then you would understand that you have found real secrets. Yeah, the way that I would recommend uh, listeners pick up the secret guides is if you're going to a place for the first time, buy one of the more traditional guides. Um, But 
layer on top the maps that you provide in yours, because oftentimes en route to one of the major attractions, mm -hmm. you're going to walk by five, 10 secret places uh, like that ferryman seat that you otherwise would just completely miss. And uh, in that way, you could get use even if you're not somebody who, who lives and knows this, these cities inside out. Yeah, it's a, it's a good way because if it, uh, indeed, if it's the first time you go to London, for example, you could have both guides, one yes. traditional one and this yes. one. Yes. And as you say, going to British Museum, uh, maybe on the way or maybe on the facade of the British Museum, there's something really interesting and really obscure that few people see that could be interesting for you as well. And you, uh, you also have a couple titles under the soul of a place yeah. as opposed to secret. So uh, yeah. what, is, what is the idea behind the soul of series? So this is very different because some people complained in the secret guides that we give no uh, information about hotels, bars, restaurants, shops, etc., which was on purpose. Because first, it changes a lot. And second, uh, but after some time, we realized that the traditional travel guides, they propose, in fact, too much information, first point. And second point, they are not demanding enough. So, for example, if you buy a traditional travel guide, you would have usually... 20 hotels, 50 restaurants, 50 bars, uh, 50 shops. And if you go to, and what most people do now, they go three days to New York, they go three days to Rome, they go three days to Paris, etc. How can they know that among the 50 hotels, shops, restaurants, etc., which, one which ones are the best? And they have no time to make the selection, to check on the internet, talk to the friends. It's too much time. So we've been all the other way around. We said, okay. We'll ask local people as well, you know, extremely well the city. But the, the deal is, give me one place that for sure, if you get there, you will have an amazing time. Amazing time. That this place is really exceptional. And places like that, you don't have hundreds of places per city like that. You have few places. Uh, so we've, select, we've defined the quantity of places to 30. So we say, okay, let's limit ourselves to 30 amazing places in the city. But these places can be bars, restaurants, hotels, etc. with a very, a very strict selection. So each place has to be like, wow, when you get there. You can't fail. And so this very strict selection has been made already. And then so it complements the secret guys because then, okay, you, know, you have the info of where to stay, where to eat where to have a drink, etc. Of course, the content is sometimes secret, but not, all, not, not only, because you can have an amazing place, which is not secret, but you can't miss it, so we talk about it. Uh, but I would say 50% of the places are really rather little known as well. So mm. it's our, always of our secret focus. Uh, but that, that's the idea. So it's uh, geared to travelers, of course, to local people as well, because some of the addresses that we're giving are not well known either. Uh, but so it's very different. It's more lifestyle, bar, restaurant, hotels, etc. But it's very interesting. Are there other uh, guidebook series that you admire for the the level of uh, journalism that goes into them, or for the originality of their recommendations? Yeah, I think there's two publishers that I like that I usually buy when I travel as well. Uh, first is the Brat Travel Guides hmm. because they, they have a niche which is basically the published travel guides only about very little known countries and the more I travel the more I go to these countries uh, so for example I was uh, this summer I was in Santa Maria and Principe it's a very small country in Africa off the coast of Gabon and Nigeria basically so very obscure very few tourists and the only travel publisher who has a guide on this country is Brat. Hmm. So, wow. so basically, that's the, the publisher I like when I travel in very remote and very little visited countries. The other one I like is, because I used to live seven years in Brazil, so I've used lots of different travel guides. And basically, the quality of the content of the travel guides on South America is by far the best at Footprint. Footprint Publishers, uh, it's an Australian publisher. And they are very respected in, in South America. Their travel guides on South America are amazingly researched. The quality of the content and the detail of the content is, is absolutely amazing. So when I travel to South America, for example, I use these guides. I'll, uh, I'll also throw in a recommendation. There's a guidebook series that I love called The Insight Guides. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, are you familiar with them? Yeah, yeah, I know them as well. Yeah, yeah I, what, I've, what I like about the Insight Guides, it's basically like the preparation you were talking about that went into Secret Venice, where if you really want to take basically the equivalent of a, a college course in the country that you're about to visit, packed with history and art, uh, it can give just a much deeper, often very academic uh, layer of understanding to the history of a place. Mm-hmm. And so, um, given your, you know, global perspective, are there any, um, countries or cities destinations that you feel should be on, uh, more tourist map, uh, but really haven't sort of entered that grand tour yet? Yeah. 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 Let's start with Europe. For example, I think one of the least visited countries in Europe, and it's, it's so beautiful and so amazing and so friendly. It's Slovenia. Slovenia is a very small country. It's stuck between Austria and Italy, basically, and Croatia. It's a kind of Switzerland, but with a Mediterranean feel. So you've got the, the lakes, you've got the mountains, but you've got this flair, you know, of, of the Mediterranean. Mm-hmm. And it's just amazing. And there are very few people. Yes, I, I've been, and uh, Lake Blade is yeah, one of Lake the... Lake Blade, for example, yeah, I've, I've loved Lake Blade. That was such... <laughs> I remember cycling around the lake. Yeah. Wow. So I, well, and, and uh, it's, it's as you say, you look at it and you say, how are more people not here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which makes it a, a blessing and a curse to talk about it on a podcast, because I don't really want it to get too popular. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. In fact, I, I, one of the reasons I think why very, there's very few people is that it's the, there's a border with Italy, and Italians are very nationalistic. So basically, they would say, you know, Slovenia, it's the, you know, it's the ex uh, Yugoslavia. So it's for them, it's like the third world. So Italians would not think about going there, uh, mm-hmm. although it's there. It's like hundred half an half an hour, an hour from there, from it's two hours from Venice. It's uh, twenty minutes from Trieste. But don't know. Italians just gonna go, just gonna go because they they have a like in their mind it's third world and Yugoslavia it's oh down. that it's a, that yeah it's such an insane misconception. Uh, the yeah. other one of the other destinations that sticks with me there is Piran, which is a seaside yeah. town on the Adriatic. Exactly. And uh, as you say, I mean, if, if if you popped somebody there, they might think that they were in an Italian town, yeah. uh, but h- much more affordable, <laughs> much less busy. Exactly, uh, but just as charming and uh, full of rich history. Exactly, because in fact, all this area on the coast was a uh, part of the Venetian Republic. So you've got basically the same architecture uh, as as Venice, as in Venice or as around Venice. So it's just gorgeous, but it's half price basically, and uh, with uh, ten times less people. Uh, other countries, for example, uh, closer to the US uh, in South America. Well, apart from Brazil, but surprisingly. Brazil uh, frightens people, you know, because it's a bit violent. But Brazil as such, there's so many amazing and remote places within Brazil where very few people go. But for example, the Amazon as such, for example, just nobody around. And it's mm. fantastic. You can make a boat trip on the Amazon for a few days, five, six days, and you just have an amazing holiday. Or you can go in Brazil to the what we call the Chapada Diamantina, it's, it's in the middle of Brazil, basically, in the, in the state of Bahia, but west of the coast, like seven, eight hours west of the coast. And it's one of the most gorgeous national parks I've ever seen in my life. And there's nobody around. Mm. Uh, or Colombia, for example. Colombia is a gorgeous country. People are a bit frightened, but now the war is over. So it's very safe. You can go anywhere, or almost anywhere. And people are extremely friendly, you know, because it, this country has been so so much stuck in the war that they see the foreigners as a gift because oh they are proud that you visit their country you know oh okay people are interested in my country now that's fantastic Mm. that is exactly the spirit i encountered um i I visited myanmar shortly after it started to open to the west uh and uh it's exactly as you say it was a, a thrill to to have tourists um you, you know, we consider sort of the problems of over tourism, but you kind of forget the upside of tourism, which is a boon to the economy and a celebration of the culture of a place. Yeah. But for, I had the same feeling, for example, as you say, in, in Myanmar or Burma, I had the same feeling in Pakistan. 
when I got to Pakistan on my Beijing to Paris trip, there was no tourist. I think I met two or three tourists in a month. Wow. And when we crossed the border, I remember the custom officer said, ah, where are you from? Of course, I didn't look Pakistani. And they said, well, we're from France. And he said, you know what? I am honored that you visit my country. Mm. Please be my guest. Do you want to come home for tonight? Do you have a place to stay? And he invited us to stay at his place. Wow. <laughs> That was wow. amazing. And he <laughs> yeah. said, you, you, you're the first foreigners I've, I've seen in, uh, in two weeks. So just, I'm feeling honored that you visit my country. You're my guest. Mm. Wow. And that was, that was the way we got into Pakistan, which is an amazing country. If you go beyond uh, the cliche, it's such a welcoming country. Amazing uh, countryside, amazing scenery, amazing mountains, culture, everything. People are incredibly friendly. But you have to go over the cliche, of course. Uh, and maybe it's not the best time now to visit. Although I think if you keep on the track coming from China uh, through the, the, the pass, you can go to Gilgit and the area, the mountains, to K2, etc. It's safe. Maybe don't go to the border with Pakistan, of course, to Afghanistan. But if you stay on, a, on the right side, if you go to Punjab, it's safe and it's really amazing. Mm. Any other destinations you'd point out? Maybe. Yeah, there was a country I've been to... Uh, Two years ago in Central America. In many countries, I was disappointed by many countries in, in Central America. I was disappointed, for example, by Nicaragua, which I found very touristic. Mm. Uh, I was not expecting that. But I love, for example, the country I love most was Salvador. Salvador is the most obscure country in South America because everybody's afraid of Salvador because the, everybody has the images of the uh, drug gangs, you know, violence, etc. But again, it's like Brazil. All this violence does exist, but basically it's, it's uh, limited to the favelas or to the, the, the suburbs of the cities mm -hmm. where the gangs are fighting each other. As a tourist, usually, you don't see that violence. Okay, you can have bad luck and you can be stuck in something, but usually you don't see that. And we crossed Salvador with my family, with the three kids and my wife. And people were telling me, you're crazy to go to Salvador. It's such a dangerous country. It's we stayed a week in Salvador. Mm -hmm. We didn't see any tourists, zero, zero tourists. We've been, again, same thing. People feel honored that you visit them because there's nobody around. So you're amazingly well welcomed. And you still have this feeling of uh, discovery. I wonder, how do you approach uh, financing your, your life, your travel? I mean, you started as such a young person before you decided to work. If it's not too personal for me to ask, yeah. I'd just be really interested to know, I mean, you, you do embrace kind of rough conditions. I mean, you know, you're sleeping yeah. in barracks, you've got a backpack on. But why don't you, you talk about, you know, how do you finance travel? Wow. Because that's something I, I always want to remind folks is you don't have to, you know, be a multimillionaire in order to no. get out there and explore. No, no, not at all. Basically, if you run out of money, by definition, it should not deter you from traveling. On the contrary, why? Because I remember my first trip, this Beijing to Paris, China, uh, Paris, to Beijing to Paris trip again. My budget, and at the time we didn't speak in euros, it was still a French franc, but uh, converted to euros, it was, my budget was 150 euros or dollars <laughs> a month. Yeah. A month. Okay. So, and at the time, as a, as a student, uh, to give an idea, if you work for a month, you would earn basically yeah, twice or three times as, as much as that, which means basically if you earn little, I mean, probably today with $150 a month, it's a bit tough. Uh, probably you need maybe $1,000 a month, but imagine $1,000 a month for traveling is not too much. It's, it's very reasonable. And as we said, have a backpack, have a tent. Uh, Talk to people, talk to local people, and you'll see that even very often people invite you. You just don't need to go to fancy hotel because uh, in addition to that, most of the time, fancy hotels are very boring. Thomas John Glass, thank you so much. It was wonderful to have you on the podcast. We will be linking out to, to a bunch of your guidebooks and your company website uh, in our show notes. And uh, now it's time for the last stop. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the last stop on this train. Everyone, please leave the train. What a great interview, Kieran. I am. Thank uh, you very much. 
it makes me very excited to pick up their Mexico City book, which I know is uh, coming out soon. Yes, yeah, Secret Mexico City. It's on the shelves now. But Ryan, uh, you know, Christmas is coming. You might want to just hold on for that oh, for Navidad. My. I don't know that you should necessarily pick that up just yet. I, oh, that would be very exciting. I mean, I'm a little hurt that I wasn't asked to at least contribute uh, since, you know, my episodes of Mexico City, I think, have really opened the doors to a lot of folks. But uh, I th- Ryan, I actually think that that guidebook is going to be perfect for you because you've been so many times, you're getting the more off the beaten track places, but there will still be uh, tens and tens of places that plaques that you've walked by, yeah. uh, little artifacts that you've ne- you've never thought twice about, architectural treasures that uh, the secret Mexico City is definitely going to scratch that edge. Is if you get it for Christmas, that is. Well, I, I, I people are going to have to tune in at our very popular Christmas episode. To Absolutely, out. Christmas yeah. spectacular, uh, <laughs> second year in a row. Uh, but Ryan, uh, so thank you to Thomas John Gleds. But listen, we've got to get to the last stop. Okay, uh. we're here in the last stop. This is uh, the final segment of the show, the last segment of the show. That's where it takes its name, the last stop. And it's a time where we uh, pause to reflect. It's a place. It's a, a, a spirit. It's sort of a spiritual moment, sort of the spiritual center of the show. It's your favorite segment, my favorite segment, popularly known as the people segment. And it's where we each say one thing that we've seen or read or cooked or ate or smelt or, or created or dreamed or thought about or pondered something that fed the spirit of wanderlust within us, even during the workaday week. So Ryan, as always, I have to ask you, do you have a last stop this week? I do have a last oh, stop, Karen. Goodness. It has been, you know, you know that I love Halloween. I, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't That's love- That's why gr- you've always got that Halloween makeup on. It's yeah, so exactly, scary. That, exactly. Ugh. No, and, and not because I, I, I dress up or, or do anything that requires me to have to participate or be a participator, but- um, <laughs> That is because, what we call it, participators. Yeah. It's participant. No, no, I call them participators. Uh, <laughs> Uh, one, uh, one of the things that I love about New York uh, around the Halloween time is, is how many haunted experiences uh, and haunted houses uh, are out there. So I want to recommend uh, two of my favorites. There are a, a bunch uh, available. Sure. Uh, the two of my favorites that I think that folks will, uh, this episode comes out on um, the, the 22nd. So you've yep. got plenty of time to go check out some, some haunted houses. Some of these go actually into early November too. So um, plenty of time to make it. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is one I've been to a couple years, and that is Blood Manor. Huh. And, and Blood Manor is sort of a traditional um, haunted house uh, in the sense that it is like you go in and you, and you, and you go from room to room and, 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 and people jump out and they, and they scare you. Um, but because it's in New York, mm-hmm. it's got really lovely production values. It's, it's well designed. and uh, It's it, like Broadway level talent that just hasn't been well, cast in Broadway shows. I, mean, I wouldn't say Broadway level <laughs> talent here, but, but, but mm, definitely talented folks. Off so, Broadway. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely equity. Sure. You know, okay. Oh, people all right. With, definitely yeah, people equity. With equity. People with equity points at least. Yeah. Probably not, you know. Are, do you, are they overperforming like they want to be cast in a Broadway show where like a vampire a, comes out and he's like, I want to blunt your blood. Mm, 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 your blood tastes so good. Well, hopefully, hopefully they're not that like campy, but they <laughs> sure. do have, I mean, there's a level of camp, you know, um, but it's absolutely massive. It's 10,000 square feet. Um, and it is a, a wow. labyrinth of, of scary pathways and people will touch you and people will scream at you and things will happen and you will be uncomfortable and you will be scared. Um, and that I, you know, it is, it is a, a really fun thing to do. Um, the tickets vary in price. So if you go on like sort of off days, you can save, uh, but we'll link, we'll link on the website, but, uh, Blood Manor, uh, really one of the largest kind of wildest experiences that you can have in the Halloween season here, here in New York. Cool. And then the second one I, re- I want to recommend, um, I'm really excited about because I'm doing it for the first time this year. Uh, the, this team, uh, they're called the Psycho Clan. Uh, they, have, they used to run a haunted house in New York called the Nightmare Experience. Mm. And so Psycho Clan, these are the folks that are behind uh, the Nightmare um, haunted house that ran for 15 years in New York. Mm. Uh, but they just started this new experience, which is, uh, you know what? I'm, I'm going to say it here in it. It's an immersive horror oh, theater experience. Fantastic. I was waiting. I, yeah. I thought it was come out on Blood Manor, yeah. but I'm, thank God this one's immersive. No, that, that is definitely not uh, immersive theater. It is a traditional haunted house. Mm. This is an immersive experience that takes place entirely in the dark. Entirely oh, so in the dark. So that's why it's called I Can't See. Exactly. Mm. Uh, and it's all uh, touch and it's uh, oh, uh, sound. 
and I am incredibly excited. Uh, I, I'm going to see it uh, this weekend. That sounds horrible. Um, it's going to be really horrifying. I am. It, it, it looks really scary. Um, this is the first year that they've they've done this, so it's a, it's it's new for them. You know, they have a ton of experience in, in the horror space, if you will. Yeah. Um. Uh, but this is this is their first sort of like t- they wanted to do something that was not a, a haunted house. And when I was I was talking to Timothy Haskell, who uh, one of the the guys who runs this and has run it for years, he said, "Now this, he said, Ryan, this is not this is not nightmare. This is not a haunted house. This is something entirely different." And we think that you will be absolutely horrified throughout the whole experience. So I am so <laughs> excited for that. And that is, I can't see. And I uh, feel like you could get that same horrified experience just putting a blindfold on in the New York City subway. Well, that <laughs> yeah, would be I mean, different. I mean, that would be, be hor- frustrating and horrified. You know, yeah, you don't want to be frustrated and horrified. You, you know? know, you want to just be pure horrified. Yeah, yeah. What? What? Uh, do you know? Do they put a blindfold on you, or is it just pitch black? I, I believe that it's entirely uh, pitch black. Mm, um, okay. So yeah, I'm I'm excited about this one. It's going to be a different experience than I'm used to. Um, you know, cause I'm used to their more traditional haunted house. So, so yeah, the, so the two things I recommend to get your scare on in New York this season is the blood manor haunted house. And, uh-huh. uh, I can't see an immersive horror theater experience. I like the idea that the, the same actor who works over at blood manor hops over to, I can't see for the late show. And yeah. so you're just, you, you're totally blinded. And then in your ear, just very close, you hear, I want to suck your blood. <laughs> I'm so good. Mm-hmm. Do, do, do. I am so blood. Anyway, oh, anyway, I can't wait to bring Charlie to some haunted houses when he's a few years older. Yeah, I mean, he's not this season. Probably he screams all the time, regardless. So, yeah, I, yeah. right now, the world is his haunted house. Just, you know, he's just <laughs> know looking feeling, around, Charlie. going, I know "This the is not a womb." Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been doing that for thirty-seven years. Let me tell you. Actually, a, a, a T-shirt that says "The Womb Where It Happens" not a bad idea. Maternity <laughs> T-shirt that is pretty darn good. <laughs> We should not put that on the pod because people, <laughs> somebody might take that idea. It's a uh, trademark, trademark. Yeah, done. Oh done. my god. So, uh, hey, do you have a uh, last stop this week? I do have a last stop, and uh, Ryan, I promise that my last stops aren't going to all be Charlie related. But this oh. week on the at announcement, least look, at least it's not Peru. I mean, <laughs> folks are just thrilled. So, uh, as, as you know, uh, when children are born in Peru, no, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> um, oh so, god. Uh, uh, <laughs> Um, we, we, um, you know, when, when you have a child, uh, people give you lots of gifts. They give you oh, lots yeah. of gifts. People are very generous. They give you, they give you books and they give you clothes and they give you blankets, socks. And we got, um, <laughs> this one gift, uh, from a listener and a friend, uh, whose, whose name is Haining, which is l- like raining with an H. That's how, right. that's how she tells people that that's what it is. And she, uh, sews, she knows how to sew. And, uh, she took the time to create a play mat for Charlie. Um, but knowing that I'm uh, his proud papa, what she did was she selected fabrics that are all travel themed. So, Ryan, I'm going to hold it oh up here so gosh. you can see it. So, first is uh, multicolored planes, these kind of biplanes with uh, fun polka dots and stripes. Oh my gosh. And then on, they're very wow. And then, uh, yeah, they're very wow related. And then on the inside, you've got uh, traffic and cars and bikes and boats. And uh, it's, it's loud. How about, and, how, about, how about electric scooters? We don't have any electric. She, uh-huh. she didn't put in any um, sort of. <laughs> she didn't put in next generation transportation. <laughs> um, so there Charlie's are. Charlie's not going to know what any of this stuff is because he's going to be like riding on a hoverboard and like That's his. True. I'm going to give this to plane. him when he's like 18. He's going to be like, "What year were you born? Good God!" <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, I have to say, it gives me. Uh, you know, we're spending a lot of time in the house right now, which yeah. uh, means we're we're not out traveling, not even doing no. local tourism, at least no. for a few weeks. Um, though we are talking about our first trip with the kid and I've got, oh. Catherine and I have been very good about, uh, banking some trips that we feel were going to be easy to do with yeah. a newborn. So, so like Sesame street, uh, Disney world, no, 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 not children themed trips. We're yeah. talking to like, uh, uh, we've got some, some out of the way trips in, in England and Ireland. We have our eye on, we think maybe a quick Costa Rica stop might be possible. The parental advice that I've gotten has been that they are actually fairly uh capable of traveling before they can like walk uh because then you just you lose right. control of them um so so we're we're gonna get the car seat ready we got yeah. the travel the travel tra- uh, uh stroller ready and now i've got this uh great um this great play mat sewn by haining uh with a travel theme and it really feeds my spirit of wanderlust 
Well, I hope that you are going to take a beautiful uh, picture of both sides and post it on the old uh, OOO podcast Instagram. Uh, that's uh, actually uh, totally. And uh, I think, I think I might even post uh, the young traveler himself in it. Uh, oh, near it, near, near the near permit. It. You know, he, his neck isn't too strong yet, so right. he doesn't love uh, laying face down on it quite yet. But he is doing tummy time on it. Yeah, that has happened. Uh, tummy but, time? Uh, yeah, tummy time. You know what tummy time is? That's I, I you, do you have to know. lay a baby on their tummy. And I then, thought you weren't supposed to lay a baby on their tummy. No, you you lay them for just a few seconds uh, to start with, and they have to lift their head up, and that develops oh. the muscles. I mean, is, you're, is as, as like a gym I'm, rat yourself, you yeah. should know that. So this is like when I'm doing my uh, uh, exercises where I lay on the floor. <laughs> I like that you even struggled to find the word exercises <laughs> because we all know that you go to the gym, sit on a bike, and check your phone. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I pedal. Sometimes. Um, well, this this is this is lovely. I I am. I, I, for one, am excited about the new direction the pod is going to take us because parenting podcast, uh, very popular. Very popular, very lucrative. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and uh, travel parenting uh, yeah. is going to be. But you know what? That is not what we're talking about next week. Too early to no. head in. I, I don't have enough no. experience to be an expert on it you yet. You definitely do not. No. no. So, Ryan, what are we talking about next week? So next week, we are talking about uh, old industrial like locations uh, that have been rehabilitated and reconfigured into beautiful parks oh yeah um, a and, major yeah. trend now yeah one of my favorite examples of this just just as an example not to give too much I, away yeah it would, it just don't give away the secret sauce here, one example one example the high line if you've ever been to the high line in mm. new york city yep, the most famous that is example. that is a great example of uh what we're talking about here so we're going to dive into some of our favorites uh it's going to be it's going to be great yeah it's such a cool trend in uh in urban planning so we're going to tell you some uh really cool parks that rehabilitate old industrial stuff well until then, I'm Ryan Davis. And I'm Kiernan Schmidt, father of Charlie Schmidt. And this is Out of Office, a travel and finally not Peru related podcast. <laughs> this seat <is> taken. <laughs> Ryan, what do you think about a Peru episode next week? Instead? I think I, I think it's time. I think it's time for another Peru episode. I think the people want it. Numero cuatro. Yeah. Number yeah, that would again, I think it's five because we did the Mark Adams one. He did two Mark Adams. No, no, but both... Mark Adams was about Alaska. He wrote a book about Peru, but we didn't talk about it that much. Oh, maybe that's fair. Maybe I'm being on. Maybe I'm. Uh, uh, that's that's I, true, yeah, right? I, I hear you. So you want a joint episode, Peru Part Four, Mark Adams Part Three? Can we have Mark, can we have Mark back? Absolutely. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>